Cade's dad, the quarterback at Arizona State, and then into the NFL. They can cover on ball, they can cover off ball. They'll great with the ball on the ground and getting it up and out. For my money, these are the top two defensemen in the country. They'll be first, second, all-American level guys. You have to love what they can do on the defensive end of the field. So if you're Richmond, who do you look to on attack to try and counter punch? Ryan Langberry is going to is going to be the player inside for them. You see it there, 70 points, the majority of those are goals. They like to find him inside. They'll generate up top with the midfielders, and then from behind the cage, it's going to be Teddy Hatfield. He'll draw the matchup of Giles Harris or Cade Van Rapphorst. Leader, all-time points leader in the SOCON, but you're going to need to generate out of the midfield today. Our officials today, Brian Abbott, Jason Park, Steve Ruppel. Great crew for a terrific game. Richmond in red with Dick, Nick DeMauro and Duke in their all-white home uniforms with Brian Smith. And Brian Smith for Duke makes easy work of it. The team of the decade looking for what would be their 10th trip to a championship weekend since John Donowski took over the program 13 years ago. We right away, you're going to see Richmond drop into the zone defense. They've been in and out of man and zone throughout the season when they headed into the, so the SOCON tournament this year against Air Force and High Point. They put in this zone defense. They'll pass cutters through. They'll play the ball carrier. You'll see as you carry across that they'll pass that to the next defender. So as we take our first look at the Duke offense, Nakai Montgomery here who had eight goals as a freshman, this time trying to look for an assist. That was eight goals as a freshman in an NCAA tournament. Ryan, Huge how, do you, man. how do you break down a zone if you're the attackman? You saw it right there from Nakai Montgomery, and you'll see it from Brad Smith for this Duke offense, but they are going to dodge the zone. So you'll see dodge right here. You want to draw kind of that in between that next defender, and then you move the ball. Here's Brad Smith. He's really settled into his more natural position at midfield. He was first team All American a year ago at that position. Got converted to attack, but in the last four games, back where he's comfortable and producing at a great rate. Eight seconds on the shot clock. Richmond trying to kill it on this opening possession. Smith got free, but Richmond gets the turnover. And for a team going up against the team of the decade in Duke, that goes a long way for the Spiders' confidence. That's the start you want. We talked about that zone defense. You're going to see that throughout the day. And the shot clock that we have this year, the 82nd shot clock, brings a different dynamic because you can't just sit back and try to pick that zone apart. You have to attack it, which is going to force those outside shots, those off-balance shots like we just saw. We mentioned the regular season meeting. Spiders had a fast start in that one. Three shots, three goals in the first two minutes and 18 seconds. After that 3 nothing start, Turner Upgren, the senior goalkeeper, pulled from that game. He did not return that game. He returned the next game. He's been lights out ever since. But when he faced this Richmond team, his shortest start of his entire career only lasted a little more than two minutes. And we talked about this before the game, Jay. You're not sure, is that a positive or a negative? He sees that game all week as you're preparing, and where is that in, in your mind? Does it motivate you to play better, or does it seep into the back of your mind that this team can shoot and this team has had success against you? First test, very comfortable for the senior Turner Upgren. It's interesting, his little brother George is a backup goalie for Richmond. You feel bad for mom Melissa on Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all mothers out there. You're wearing that half Richmond, half Duke jersey when you have two sons on the field. Someone's season is ending today. For Turner, it would be his college career. But hey, if you're mom, you get to see both boys one day True. on Mother's Day. There's the, 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 the glass half full view of this. See the second midfield for Duke. Kevin Quigley, Jake Sayow, Riley Walsh. I think Duke is as deep as any team in the country from the midfield. They'll play both units almost equally. This is Kevin Quigley, the junior. Ten goals to his name this season. You see that attack the zone, attack the seam, try to draw two, and then quickly get it out of your stick. I love six there, Jason Reynolds. He's the top defenseman for Richmond. Always playing 100 miles an hour. Shot clock winding down again. Aaron pass. And it's an over and back call. Back to back defensive stops for this Richmond team. They're going to call a delay a game.
seconds. White seven, delay a game, take Lally, foul, Lally. 30 seconds. Goes against Brad Smith. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Seven, they call that on Cade Van Rapport. So when the ball came over, he has to touch it for the over and back, right? Because otherwise Richmond can push that transition. So I guess when he touched it, he rolled it away from Richmond, which causes the delay of game. Spiders go on the extra man, 30 seconds. And if you're an upset-minded team like Richmond, these extra man opportunities so, so important against a team like Duke. And they have skill. You see it there from Savoka. I, I like their offense. I think there's, they may not have the advantage athletically, but from a skill perspective, I think they're as good and as talented as any team in the country. Feeding inside, knocked away. Schultz recovers for Richmond. Back to even strength now. They're going to give Savoka a go. He generally draws the pole. Prendergast for Duke is. Just as good as most polls, but you like this matchup if you're Richmond. All the way back out to the redshirt sophomore, Tate Gallagher. 20 seconds left on the shot clock. And Richmond opens the scoring. The hottest stick on the Spiders team, Ryan Lanchberry. Beats Turner Upgren. And to get on the board first here in Koskinen will go a long way for Richmond. And we talked about how good they are from a skill perspective. You just see that attack the middle of the field. Lanchberry fades off the backside. Just a great job finding space. And JT Giles Harris just a step too slow to get there. That's their guy on offense. You see it there. 50 goals this season, a SoCon record, a great finisher, great hands. Talking to Coach Chimati, the most prolific recruit Richmond's ever had. Comes from north of the border. Chimati told us the hardest part about selling a high-profile recruit, just getting him to Richmond from Canada. Uh, he came to the campus. He loved it. He committed. And it's one thing to be the most high-profile recruit to come to a program, a new program like Richmond, only in their sixth season, but another to live up to those expectations like he has only a sophomore. They're going to build a powerhouse there. Coach Shamadi, Coach Richards have done a great job. It's a beautiful campus. It's a high academic institution. They're in their sixth season, and, and, and they've been into their conference finals every year. They've been to the NCAA tournament three times. That's unheard of for a program that new, new to have that much success early on. Teddy Hatfield, senior, trying to pick a pass. He had Lanchberry wide open, but missed him. This is a Duke team taking the field for the first time in 15 days. Lost in the semifinal to Notre Dame. Which gave him a week off, and it was interesting talking to John Donowski, how do you prepare for the team you don't know? And he said, practice fundamentals, go back to the basics. This Duke team typically so sharp, but off the off. Couple of turnovers, almost a goal. Great stop by Turner Upgren to deny Tim Adams in transition. Richmond still fighting for it now. And it ends up in the stick of CJ Carpenter. Joey Manow feeding it back to Smith. Duke's going to calm things down offensively. We've talked about it. Richmond is not intimidated. If they have transition, they'll push it. They've played this Duke team before. They beat Notre Dame. They've had success against the traditional Blue Blood programs in the past. So if there's an opportunity there, they are not going to pull it out and try to play small ball. They're going to step on the throat, step on the gas, and try to score goals. Feeding inside, looking for Carpenter. Ball's on the grass. Richmond comes away with it. Great job by Joey Manown to win the ball right back. That resets the shot clock as well for this Duke attack. Montgomery's got space. Trying to unlock this Richmond zone defense. Manown takes it in. Big time hit. Ray Barron denying Manown. 
And the Spiders come away with it. Boy, has this defense been impressive early. Menges all over the place. Non-stop moto from 40 and red. You see how fast and how aggressive they play on both ends of the field, but, but certainly on defense already. They're not going to have the, the natural athleticism that a team like Duke has. Duke is as athletic as any team in the country, but they play at 100 miles an hour, and they play through every ground ball and, and through every whistle, which sometimes you can make up that athletic gap just through pure effort. Hadfield feeding inside. Double team comes in. Lance Perry had nowhere to go. You just got a taste of what makes this Duke defense so dominant. That's the second time they tried to force it into him inside. Right? The first one, he's fading off the back, and you get that. But the last two possessions, just trying to jam it inside. The first time they miss him, that time he just gets doubled down on. So we told you before the game, theme of the weekend, goals, 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 goals. Well... Personnel-wise, we were expecting more of a defensive battle here. So far, midway through the first quarter, that's what we've got. Duke still looking for that first goal of the game. His Richmond zone defense has troubled the Blue Devils early. And, and it's going to be a, a challenge all day, I think. If you, you knew Richmond was going to play zone, so how would you get an idea of how Duke would play against it? You'd look at their man-up unit. That's usually a good correlation between how a team plays against zone. Duke's just over 30% on the year, so they don't do a great job against the zone defense, which is what man down is. First time Jack Rustbold has been tested today, and he answers it very well. Went low to deny Kevin Quigley. Russ Bold, the transfer from Penn State, split time throughout the year, but has really won the job after he was the MVP of the SOCON tournament with 26 saves. Richmond a little sloppy in transition. They give it away. JT Giles Harris immediately scoops it up. Duke thought they'd try and score in transition before that zone defense sets up but they pull it out well, i said it earlier i don't i don't think richmond's afraid to push transition i don't know if i would suggest they push transition i think that you do want to take a little bit of pressure off your defense settle down some of these possessions on offense you don't want to get into a track meet with you you, you do want to play a six on six game where it's your group against theirs as opposed to trying to out athlete them across the middle of the field Quigley again, he's been active early. That just misses wide. You know, Ryan, we mentioned Russ Bold, the goalkeeper, his 26 saves in the SOCON tournament. They went in last weekend knowing we have to win this tournament to keep our season alive. A different mentality than Duke had in the ACC tournament. The Blue Devils lose in the semifinal, and boom, you're given the two seed. You're comfortable. Yeah, and I don't know if anybody... I think there was thought they may get a two seed. I, I would say that people were probably a little bit surprised when they did get it. Uh, I think it worked out well to lose in the ACC. You get that bye week, it gives their guys a chance to finish finals and recharge their body. I think mentally it also gives you a different perspective. You get an idea of, of what it could mean to end your season. So if you're a senior, it was kind of that first wake-up test of if we lose, this is over. And they had that in the ACC tournament, and now you're facing that in the NCAA tournament. And in that SOCON tournament, Richmond played two teams that they lost to in the regular season. They lost to Air Force, went and beat them in the semifinal. Then they put a good win on High Point, a team that beat this Duke team earlier in the year. So playing with confidence, and it showed up in Durham. Ryan Lanchberry, he's got both for the Spiders, and it's a surprise 2-0 start. John Donowski says, give me a timeout. It's been the Ryan Lanchberry show early. I thought Richmond was going to come to play, sweeping across the top and hitting Lanchberry. 2 0 Richmond. For the second time this season, first was in weather conditions that Duke coach John Donowski called the most miserable of his entire career. 40 degree, driving rain. Richmond led 3-0 early, Duke won 11-7. It's interesting, Donowski pulled starting goalkeeper Turner, Upgren after three minutes, so Upgren's already made it longer than he did in that regular season matchup, but it took a lot of effort from this Duke team 
to beat Richmond. It was a one-goal game entering the fourth quarter. They shut him out 3 nothing. and got the win. But if you're Richmond, you can say, hey, for three quarters, we played with these guys. We hang up, and you, you play that card. If we play a full 60 minutes, we pull out a win or, or, or a one-goal game with Duke. And like we said earlier, they beat Notre Dame. They played Maryland to a one-goal game. They are not intimidated by these Blue Blood programs. They've had success before. And if you're Ryan Lanchberry, who is shut out against the Blue Devils, guess what? Two goals in this opening quarter. It's the only two goals that we've seen so far today in Durham. Both come on similar plays. If you let Richmond attack the top side, open up that defense, and Lanchberry fades out the back side, that's where the looks are coming from. The challenge is when they try to jam it to him on the crease. Ball flies out of the faceoff X, and Duke tries to set up a clear attempt on the last five possessions for the Blue Devils. It's resulted in three turnovers. They are struggling with this tenacious Richmond defense. It's that zone, right? You get impatient in the zone, and I said it earlier, they struggle on man up this year, just over 30%, and that's a good indicator of how you play against zone defenses. In basketball, you'll hear a phrase, zone buster. Who could be the zone buster for this Duke team? Well, for Duke, it's got to be Brad Smith and Nakai Montgomery. This is the other one, Ledman. He's the one that can really pull it from outside. Manown, Robertson, and Carpenter are more inside finishers, so you need to get some of these zone busters outside. Brad Smith, Ledman, and Nakai Montgomery. There you go. Brad Smith! Puts it where Russ Bolt can't get it. Down the right alley and cashes in. And the senior captain puts the Blue Devils on the board. Textbook shooting. Down the alley, get that stick high. They're going to attack the zone defense. You alley dodge, you should have that defender coming up. There is showed us a step too late to get there, but what a shot from Brad Smith. That's your zone buster. You said it. Smith delivers. Uh, first team All-American a year ago at midfield. Had to play this season the first 10 games of it at attack. And boy, since he's moved back to midfield, like riding a bike, he's picked it right up. He has been a different player for this Duke team. We're talking to Coach Danowski, going into this season, they didn't have that alpha male attackman that they've always had. Well, he's been there between Matt Danowski, Ned Crotty, Jordan Wolf, last year Justin Gutterding. They're missing that alpha male, and they felt like they needed it. So they moved Brad Smith there, and it just wasn't a good fit. He wasn't making plays. He wasn't producing. So you take him out, move him back to midfield, where he's been playing the, the early part of his career. And like you said, just riding a bike, he's producing right away. This is what's big. If, if Richmond can be competitive at the face-off X and they can give this offense possessions, that's one of the areas of weakness. They're just over 30%, but they're 50% right now. Each team's run two face-offs. If they can hang in there and make that a 50-50 game, I think they're in good shape today. Ryan Lee curling around the cage, got his hands free, but the senior couldn't put it in the back of the net. 21 seconds left on this shot clock. They're going to test the. Oh, maybe not. I thought they'd test that. Hatfield on Fowler. Walter's range gave Savoka a lot of trouble last time they played. Lanchbury, he's got both goals today. Not a smart pass there, it was easily read by Jack Fowler. Richmond's getting away with some of these careless turnovers so far because Duke's been inefficient on offense, but again, I think they need to take care of the ball. Limit the skip passes. Spiders head coach Dan Giamatti, he knows if you're an unseeded team playing Duke, you can't afford five turnovers a quarter. You can't. You can't. That's, that's, they're on plays that you really don't need to make, just these skip passes that are either getting picked off or just getting through the entire team and out of bounds. So now we're down to another midfield for Duke. So we've seen their first two. Here's their third unit with Caputo, Bador. 
the Blue Devils can hold for the last shot if they want to. More time left in the first quarter than there's left on the shot clock. Not going to get that final shot off. Richmond comes away with it, but gives it right back. 15 seconds left to the opening quarter. Here's Manown. Goes to work. These are the killers, those last second possessions. Right over the top. Six seconds left. It'll stay with Duke. One last chance to tie this game at two. Quick feed. And through 15 minutes, Richmond can say they are beating the number two seed of the country. All weekend on ESPNU, you've seen goals, goals, goals. Penn State, they're full of goals, 25 of them. But guess what? Three goals scored. Richmond's got two of them. Spiders, one goal lead going to the second quarter. Championships is brought to you by Mazda. Feel alive. And Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. A happy Mother's Day to all Duke and Richmond mothers out there and all moms tuning in for some lacrosse action. Ryan Flanagan, Jay Alter with you. It's interesting talking with Kate Van Rapport's Duke defender yesterday. We were talking about how moms don't get the credit they deserve going to practices, even going to some recruiting camps. He said he was a sophomore in high school. They live in Arizona. Mom and him go all the way to Connecticut for a recruiting showcase. He said she went over to the sidelines to watch where all the D1 coaches were standing. At the end, she goes, you know, those are some intense dads of those kids. She goes, Mom, those were the 30 D1 coaches that I'm trying to play for. And yet, Cade's mother was chatting them all up. Which one's your son? Oh, Which I one? love it. I love it. I'm sure she's happy with how it's all worked out. Absolutely. Another win for Richmond on the faceoff X. Whoa. They give the backup to Duke. That was questionable. A game of inches, and they say that Turner Upgren got there first. Closest to the ball, so they'll say that Upgren was close to the ball. Richmond may have been closer to the end line. Do you like Richmond not trying to protect that lead and play conservatively? They go right into attack mode to start the second quarter. Yeah, it's way too early to sit back. And like I said, they are comfortable. I mean, they don't worry. This is... A big game for them, but, but no bigger than any other game. But Duke's going to make it a tough one for him, that's for sure. We're tied at two thanks to the junior, Kevin Quigley. Got the feed from Brad Smith and those two Blue, Phil, Blue Devil midfielders getting Quig it done. Quigley has been at Duke for what seems like forever. Skipping across the field, through that zone defense. Stinging it right off the hip of Russ Ball. What a shot from Quigley. Those are the guys that need to step up. The guys that have been at Duke again for what seems like forever. Quigley the junior, Smith the senior. Another win for Richmond. This is a bit of a surprise. Richmond came in only 35% from the faceoff X as a team and they've won four out of the first six to start this game. But as much as Richmond has struggled this year, Diamario's best game was last week against High Point. So, you do have to say, if there's a time to play well, this is it. And so far today, he's looked, I think, better than expected. Richmond riding high after beating Air Force and High Point in the SOCON tournament, two teams they lost to in the regular season. Now looking for a third straight win against the team they lost to in the regular season, losing to Duke nine weeks ago, 11-7. Duke is giving the top side. And Richmond makes him pay. Tate Gallagher goes low to beat Upgren and fires the Spiders right back in front. I don't know why Duke is doing this. There must have been something they saw in the scouting report. But every time Richmond dodges, they are attacking the top side of the field. And that opens up the heartier defense. So you saw it earlier in our, in our clip there. Richmond attacks the top side of the field. They get the Duke defense to step up. And then they skip it to the back side and low to low shot from Tate Gallagher. But Duke is allowing Richmond to get where they want to go on the field. It was Gallagher with the goal. Tyler Schultz has all three assists for Richmond. And 
speaking with Spiders head coach Dan Shimati. He said, we will let him dodge, feed, run our offense. If we've got 50 possessions, all 50. And that's why. He's got a great vision for the game. Comes up with all three assists on the three goals Richmond has. So West Jenny, New York guy, high IQ. Comes from a lacrosse powerhouse. Playing West, for Coach Masser. West Jenny, the same high school. Coach Chimati. Coach Dad Chimati. That was before Chimati actually went from West Jenny to Duke where he played college. Can't sleep on Nakai Montgomery picking up right where he left off last May. This is what he's capable of. When he flips the switch, he's as good as any midfielder in the country. Just comes out of the box. I think Richmond's slow to play him because of how deep he is. But you step in there, right through the wickets of Rusbolt. I think he wishes he had that back. Nakai Montgomery shoots it high to low almost every time he shoots a time in the room. And the scout's there for goaltenders. You just got to be quick to get to that. You see how good he was at football. Dad played at Texas Southern. He was a big high school football player at the Episcopal School in Dallas. Freak athlete. One of those 4 4 40 guys. And of course, he scored eight goals as a coming out party last NCAA tournament. Eight of his 14 goals scored in May a year ago. Now it's expected for number 15 in white. Here he is again. Duke's made some change. They, they've kind of changed the midfield a couple of times. You see Quigley now running with Brad Smith and Montgomery. Two sticks down on the grass. Opportunity opened up for Joe Robertson. Mingus broke his stick on Brad Smith. That's huge. If you can get a stop there where it's six on five in one of those broken stick scenarios. Manown coming from behind. Pride the ball free, but Richmond recovers. They had numbers. If Tim Adams stays, they have numbers there. Before the Montgomery goal was telling you, Chimati back at his alma mater where he won two ACC titles in the early 2000s. Of course, before John Donowski took over the program. It was interesting on the call. He goes, I am 100% Richmond. Not a, you know, it's easy because you're not going against your former coach. You're going against a different program. That one off the pipe. Upgren might have got a piece of it. And Duke can run in transition. Here are the two. Kate Van Rapphorst and Giles Harris pushing transition. Both guys have stayed out there. Ball's free. Van Rapphorst runs to it. Lights in the crease. Crease violation. Richmond's ball. So same thing, they've got numbers here if they want to push it. This is Tate Gallagher, down the left alley, passes back. Getting the hands free and cashing in. Mitch Zavoka takes it right into the teeth of the Duke defense and makes it 4-3 Richmond. We said it in the open, you need to initiate out of the midfielders. And it's been all the Richmond midi so far. The throwback to Savoka runs through the check of Giles Harris. We talked so much, and all season we've talked so much about JT and, and Cade Van Raphorst. Richmond knows that. They're going to attack out of the midfield. And as good as Terry Lindsay and John Prendergast are, they're allowing these Richmond middies to get to the spots they want to go, which is opening up that Duke defense and forcing them to slide. Richmond giving number two Duke everything they can handle and more. And another face-off win. Leading in that department 5-4. And we've seen unseeded teams get crippled by the face-off position. In this tournament, Dan Shimani wants a timeout, gets it. Great call. 
seeded teams have just been able to win faceoffs, dominate possession, and win the game. That is not the case so far. Richmond hanging with the down in Durham. Ryan Flanagan, Jay Alter with you. When you talk about Dan Chimati, he's the only coach in Richmond lacrosse history. Granted, he launched the program. It's only six years old, and it's impressive. In just a short time, he's already made three NCAA appearances. And Chimati, I guess that next step would be advancing in the NCAA tournament. And so far, he's got his guys mentally prepared. And part of the reason why is they go and challenge themselves during the regular season. Yeah, every year you look at their non-conference schedule and, and you see this season that one goal loss to Maryland to start it off, beating Notre Dame, losing to Duke, losing to Virginia, but being competitive primarily in that Duke game. They don't back down from anybody. They've had success in the last four years against the Blue Blood programs. And that's why we talk when they play Duke today, this isn't like a, 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 an up-and-coming program playing a Blue Blood. They have had success in these big games in the regular season now they just need to transition that into the postseason. Richmond has not been gun shy. Taking lots of cracks at Turner Upgren's cage. If you're just joining us and thinking to yourself, how is Richmond leading number two Duke? Three of the four spider goals cashing in off Duke turnovers. It's been an uncharacteristic sloppy game for the Blue Devils. Turner Upgren read it very well. Tate Gallagher tried to beat him low where he's been vulnerable, and the senior said no. And you're going to see a lot out of these Richmond midfielders. That's been the key so far. And they want to play this slower game, and, and that's what you're getting. Obviously, they've been a little bit more patient towards the second half of the first quarter and, and into the second quarter with the ball on offense, and they've been quick to get into this zone defense when Duke does have possession. Here's Brad Smith. Goes right. Bouncer. Rossbold's got a piece of it. Duke recovers. And it's a fresh 80 seconds on the shot clock. He's their best player, Brad Smith. But as he goes, this Duke team goes. And so you attack the seams, try to draw two, and get the ball out of your stick. Now they've got the defense rotating. Had Benown on the doorstep, but the pass over his head. So Montgomery should have come across the top of the field with that. I think he threw it back into the rotating defense. They had him beat if they move it across the top of the field, which is where you'll get your better looks against this zone defense. In a zone defense, you're going to get plenty of looks. It's taking the right looks, not getting baited in to the look they want to give you. It's quick ball movement. Like you said, it's get the quality looks. Don't settle for the 15-yarders. And you have to play angles, right? And I think above the cage, in front of the cage, those are the highest percentage looks. And, and throwing that back down to the pipe, though you can get a good look right on the pipe, it's a lower angle, a lower percentage shot. This is Teddy Hatfield curling around the cage, drawing two, dumping it back. Stays with Richmond. The shorty right away. Lanchbury trying to get those hands free, does, but can't capitalize. So L Lanchbury is traditionally not a Dodger, but they may go on this short stick matchup, or they'll go into a two-man game with him and Hatfield or him and Ryan Lee. Less than 15 seconds to work with on the shot clock. Patrick Shea That's down the left alley. Upgren stops him. The Step rebound the goes to Lee. Steps to the crease. Great call, Ryan. Duke possession. That was too easy for Richmond. You've got to get your hands on the dodge there. Great save by Upgren. We've hammered it home. That's where this game's going to be close, in the midfield, where these Richmond offensive middies can dodge in the Duke defensive midfielders. Here's Garrett Ledman. He's been quiet. Passes off. Deflected right in front of Rustbold. Duke on the restart. Trying to unlock this Richmond zone defense, which has given them a ton of trouble in this first half.
Sean Lowry. Haven't called his name too much today. Circling it around. They got him rotating. See, now you can move the ball quickly. Great save. Jack Russ pulled right at the whole way. And that's not a bad look, right? I mean, you're, you're 15 yards, 14 yards with nobody on you. But if you're Richmond, those are the looks you're going to settle for, those, those deep shots. Stuff that Russell has a chance to save. In postseason lacrosse and in postseason hockey, there's nothing more dangerous than a hot goaltender. Well, Jack Rusbold's coming off of Southern Conference MVP. 26 saves in two games to keep Richmond's season alive. He already has four today. And those are the types of, uh, of looks that teams are taking. You saw that in the SoCon tournament where teams are taking those deep shots. What a save. Upgren had left the crease, but gets back to make the save. Great job by the senior. Now here's Duke in transition. Richmond hurrying back. Brad Smith trying to get those hands free. The men just came in a little too far there. C.J. Carpenter, nobody stepped up, and the senior makes Richmond pay. Richmond gets caught in the substitution game. We knew coming in that Duke would be okay playing five on five, so they keep Pete Welch down at the bottom of the screen. Richmond tries to sub, and they're down a man. You see five for red, that's six coming in late. But your zone is unorganized. That allows Carpenter to get inside. Usually Richmond is waiting for that defender to step up and support. He's not there and a great shot by Carpenter. C.J. Carpenter, a byproduct of Brad Smith moving back to midfield. The senior gets more playing time on attack and he takes six scoreless games and turns it into 11 goals in his last five games. He's a perfect example of what Coach Donowski and this staff do well. Came into Duke, didn't expect to be a huge contributor, but they developed that talent so well that now as a senior, as a redshirt senior, he's starting to play his best lacrosse late in the year. So perfect product and example of what this Duke staff does so well. Stays with Duke. Both teams were fighting for that ground ball in postseason play. It's those 50-50 balls that separate teams. And it leads to a goal. Joey Manown takes it right to the rack and puts Duke up 5-4. Instant offense from Duke. Coach Sanowski on our call this week said they want to attack before Richmond can get into that zone defense. And here it is. No slide. The zone's not set up. No support. And Joey Manown underneath. Diving across the face. Finish. Five Duke goals from five different players, but now the latest to add his name to the tally. Duke fans, they're familiar with seeing number 31 score goals in May. Manown obviously wears Jordan Wolf's number 31. And you can see the momentum starting to shift in this second quarter as Duke goes on a run. And they need more of that out of Joey Manown, out of Joe Robertson. We talk so much about Brad Smith and Nakai Montgomery generating offense above the cage. Those are the two guys below the cage that need to start to dodge and create. First lead of the game, if you can believe it, for the two seed Duke. And another goal! C.J. Carpenter again! His second goal of the afternoon. And Duke is surging in this second quarter. A 3-0 run for the Blue Devils. You see the smile on his face after that goal. Who's playing better at the end of the season than C.J. Carpenter? Time, room, bullseye. Overhand, put in that low corner. We just talked about his story and how he's gotten better and better every year. Love to see him playing his best lacrosse this part of the season. 
three goals in 51 seconds for Duke. Dan Shamati takes a timeout. Smart timeout when you have a team like Duke going on a run. Richmond goes from leading 4-3 to trailing 6-4 in just 51 seconds. And that's what makes this man so good. John Donowski in year number 13 with Duke in search of his 10th championship weekend since joining the Blue Devils. They have been a juggernaut. He, he does such a good job. We've, we've hounded on about developing his team. He's got such a long-term focus and long-term in terms of the, the season. He doesn't think about winning games in February and, and March. He wants to just get better every week. And you see the success they've had in the tournament. It's been down recently, but again, over that 10 to 15 year span, with as many Final Fours and as many championship games they've been to, if you're any program, you can only hope for that kind of success. Even with the last four years not taking home a national title, this is still the team of the decade. They have been called that, and rightly so. You'd say Duke and Maryland, right, in the Final Four. I mean, almost every year right. you feel like they're a staple to be there. You look at this team coming into the season, obviously everyone was high on Yale. I think Duke was the number two, and, and a lot of that comes from the idea of they lose 13-11 to Yale in the national championship, and the only player they really lost was Justin Gutterding. You feel like they returned a majority of the team, and talking to Coach Stanowski, the team had to learn to go through a season, to have those ups and downs, those wins and losses, and I think this year has been different because of how much they have struggled late in the year. They're 3-3 three and three in their last six, and, and one of those wins is the overtime against Marquette, but now you're in May, now you're in a new season, and this is when Duke's at their best. Three national championships this decade. Nine championship weekend appearances since John Donowski has taken over this program. It's interesting on the call with him this week, Ryan, he goes, you know, the elephant in the room was we could have added another national championship. We came so close. And he hopes that th that'll fuel this team that comes off a loss of the ACC tournament to Notre Dame to say, we don't want this season to end on a loss like it did last May. And we said earlier, I think the loss in the ACC tournament was a little bit of an eye-opener. You know, your season ended, your regular season ended with that loss. And I think having that week off and watching other teams play put that taste in the senior's mouth and in the team's mouth of, of what could happen if we lose again. Duke has won five of the last six face-offs. A microcosm for the momentum swing in the second quarter. Richmond just trying to weather the Duke storm in the final three minutes and 40 seconds of this quarter. And you know in that timeout, Coach Janowski just boots this team up, built the confidence. Confidence leads to goals. Joey Manown does it again, his second goal. Everything coming up Duke in this second quarter. You're starting to find those seams. You're starting to find those openings in the Richmond zone. You move Brad Smith behind the cage, a natural quarterback, an attackman in high school, just picking you apart. No pressure in his hands. Great off ball cut by Manown. Look at that feed right on the ear, catch and finish. Four goals in a minute and 29 seconds for Duke. They go from down one to up three. A hold called against Duke. It goes to Richmond. Spiders need an answer here. It has been all Duke over the last two minutes. You need a good possession here if you're Richmond. Obviously after that run from Duke. Use some of this shot clock. Gallagher on the move. Eyeing up his options, passes back. Tyler Schultz who has three assists to his name today. And they like this matchup.
Crossfield pass to Hatfield. Here's the senior. Feed inside, going low. Upgren's there to meet it. It's only the second shot attempt for Richmond in the last eight minutes. And it's not a bad look, but I think you'd want a better one where you can get a little bit more power on the shot. It was a nifty handle, but I, I don't know if that's the best look that Coach Shimadi wants. It's interesting, Ryan Duke had that 15 day layoff between the ACC semifinal and this game. Maybe first quarter, early second quarter, just shaking off the rust. And now, the Duke we've seen over the last five minutes, this is the team worthy of a two seed in this tournament. And it's an adjustment. You prep for that scout and you see that scout in practice, but it's always different to see it in practice versus how it's executed by your opponent in the game. And I think that first quarter was a bit of figuring it out. That's a big takeaway from Tim Adams. Got right in the thick of it. Much needed from Richmond. Take Gallagher or the Spiders offense can hold for the last shot if they so choose. They will, I think they'll move it around. You likely see them dodge with about 15 seconds left. It'll be one of these Richmond midfielders on a Duke short stick. You like Savoka. If he's got the short stick matchup, so they have the pole on Gallagher. So it's going to be Savoka or Schultz who's had early success so far today. What you expect is whoever's on the crease will probably be Lanch Bear or Hatfield who will make their way in there, but they will fade off the backside and I'd look for the skip through. Looking inside, Gallagher jumps in. It's good. With nine seconds left in the second quarter, Tate Gallagher delivers a much needed goal for the Spiders. Efficient offense. We knew they'd be patient. You dodge with about 15 seconds left. Great ball movement. There you go, skipping it through the defense. Schultz with another assist. And Gallagher, he's too long, jumps out through the crease, reaches around upgrade and puts it home. I like his game more of it. An outside shooter, but you can see there his skill inside, he can handle. He's long, about 6'3. 6'4", a redshirt sophomore. He's got a ton of upside. Coach Chimati's excited about what his future looks like for this Richmond program. First Richmond goal since the 10-minute mark. Desperately needed for the Spiders headed into halftime. Looking for one more. Don't get it. A slow start for the Duke Blue Devils, but the number two seed in this tournament takes a two-goal lead to the second half. We said it earlier, Richmond is not intimidated. Hanging with Duke. High skill, but Duke can shoot it. 7-5 at half. We welcome you back to Durham. Third quarter action about to begin. Duke taking care of Richmond right now. 7-5, it was a terrific first half alongside Ryan Flanagan, I'm Jay Alter. Ryan, it was slow going for the two seed in this tournament. Blue Devils only one goal in that first quarter, but boy, you started to see it click in that second quarter. They started to figure out that Richmond zone defense. They were off last week, so I'm sure there was a little bit of rust just coming into a game. They started late in the, in, in the first half to figure that out. Now the question is, if you're Richmond, do you stay in that zone defense or do you flip to a man-to-man? -man? Both teams with turnovers for six turnovers, uncharacteristic of a John Donowski May team. Typically, they don't beat themselves, but credit that Richmond defense. They definitely had them out of sorts. And at the face-off position, we are even at seven, and we go right back to the X to start this third quarter. That's the number that stands out to me. I think coming into the game, we didn't think that Richmond was going to be able to hang at the face-off X and to be 50%. You've got to be happy if you're Coach Giamatti. It's Joe Stein in at the face-off position for Duke and Jacob Griffin for Richmond. So both coaching staffs going with a new guy to start this second half. Richmond comes up with much needed possession. They only attempted two shots in the final eight and a half minutes. 
of that first half. It felt like it got away from a little bit. Like they didn't have possession and they weren't able to get the looks they wanted. That turnover number we saw at half, eight turnovers in the first half, I think they need to be more efficient than that. They can't afford to turn it over another eight, ten times this half. Spin that positively for Dan Shamati. A goal to start the second half. Take Gallagher. You talk about all the troubles they had in that first half, weathering that storm, and boom, look, you're only down one against number two Duke. We've hammered it. This Richmond midfield is where they're going to have success. You see it there, no slides, stick swinging, and Tate Gallagher, the 6'4", 200-pound-plus midfielder, right down the middle. He's too big. I love his game. Been great today with three goals. You saw the one right before halftime where he comes underneath and jumps in front of the crease, and then that one right down the middle. A ton of upside in his career. You see it listed as a junior. He's a redshirt sophomore. Two years of eligibility left after this. Now Gallagher picked a good time to record his first hat trick of the season. And those two goals coming back to back. He scored right at the end of the first half to make it a three goal or a two goal game. And now a one goal game. Richmond has come to play giving number two Duke everything they can handle. They're out in the zone to start. And they really pack it in. They do, and I think when Roosevelt's playing that well, you can do that. Montgomery got one from about 15. Brad Smith got one from outside. Carpenter got one from outside, so they're, they're starting to fall. Bouncer from Montgomery. So easy for Jack Rustbold. He had a really good first half. Didn't talk about it enough, but to have a goalkeeper who's unafraid from being the against these top teams. Spent one year in the Big Ten, transferred from Penn State. He is really comfortable. He beat Notre Dame earlier this season, lost a one-goal game at Maryland, and now hanging punch for punch with a loaded Duke offense. And we said it, that Richmond's not intimidated by these bigger teams, these high-profile teams, and, and I think that's a perfect example. Roosevelt's at Penn State playing with the Grant Amons, the Mac O'Keefe's the world. Look at the success they're having. We're tied at seven. Richmond with an automatic response to start the second half. Again, it all starts with the midfield, as you see. Dodge across the top, come from behind. Duke has got to stop allowing these Richmond midfielders sweep across the front of the cage. You've got to keep them down the alleys, make those low angle shots. They're giving up top side and it's allowing these Richmond midfielders to read the entire defense and just pick it apart. First goal of the game for the senior Ryan Lee. And it's a 3-0 Richmond run. Here come the Spiders and another face-off win. It's been the same play over and over, right? Dodge across the top, sweep the box, fade the backside, and finish with time and room. A lot of teams on the road against the team of the decade in the opening round of the NCAA tournament, let alone a program who's in its infancy, only six years old. Probably would have rolled over in that second quarter. They Not don't care. This Richmond team. They don't care. Here they go again. Sweep across the top. There's the fade. It's Lee again. Goes back behind the, the cage invert. at X. Giles oh, flag. Harris comes up, draws the flag. One more and they'll go. There's Schultz on Pender Pendergrass again. This is the matchup they want. Schultz four assists today, passing off again. Twenty seconds on the shot clock. Savoka eyeing up his options, muscling his way in. And now we'll get our penalty. Duke might have gotten away with the hold there, too, with Lindsay kind of pulling on Savoka. You see Giles Harris here. Slides to Ryan Lee. Just that one in the back is what will get you. You can come on the hands, but you got to stay off the lower back. One minute extra man opportunity. Richmond looking for the lead.
Spiders running a 3-0 run. You'll see Lance Bracey makes his way inside, then wheels back out. Inside to Hatfield, didn't get those hands free. Suffocated by the Duke defense, and the Blue Devils come away with it, look to kill the penalty. I don't think he realized how much time he was going to have. It was pretty open. I think that was a little bit too easy for Duke. If you're Richmond, you want to press on those short sticks and make Cade Van Rapport's carry in the middle of the field with a long pole on him. Duke kills the penalty. Back to even strength now. So they've got Brad Smith playing attack now, and that's got to be because of his feeding ability. So they want to keep him on the field against this zone defense because it's not as much of a dodging situation. So he'll rotate down, he'll play with the attack unit now, and he'll bring Lowry out of the midfield. Ten seconds on the shot clock. Duke has to hurry. Here's Sean Lowry. That's Back too much to room. fellow senior. Brad Smith goes low. Met by Russ Bold. Great save by Russ. I thought they were a little too soft giving Brad Smith too much room from about 14 yards there. Jack Russbold takes it all the way out, delivers the pass to successfully complete the clear. A Richmond team that has come into this third quarter with all the momentum. How do they keep it going? Be efficient on offense, right? What killed them in the first half was throwing the ball away. But if they can be efficient on offense, use the clock, and get good quality looks, I think they'll be just fine. Brett Randall has Hatfield poked away. Cade Van Rapport showing why he's one of the best defenders in the entire country with that cause turnover. I think he'll be the defenseman of the year in college lacrosse. You talk about Chris Fake from Yale is one of the top guys. Mellon from Syracuse. Giles Harris on his own team. Well, but it's interesting. JT Giles Harris, he won ACC Defender of the Year, so it'd be interesting if his teammate then won Defenseman, Defenseman of the Year. Yep. I think if you look what Cade does, statistically, there you go. Nakai Montgomery, rear back and fire, young man. The sophomore with a flamethrower gives Duke the lead right back. Second time we've seen this from Montgomery today. A great dodger, but becoming an elite shooter. She may just steps off, lets him go, and that's too much room for Montgomery. See that high to low, put that in the low corners. But again, the scout on him is that he's going to shoot low. And the goalies need to anticipate that and know when that sticks high, it's coming low. Nakai Montgomery. A breakout performance a year ago when he delivered eight of his 14 goals in May. He had the pedigree, certainly the athleticism. You talk to John Donowski, he says, when I look for a recruit, genetics plays a big role in Nakai Montgomery's father, a stud football player. Nakai himself a stud football player. And it is translated to the game of lacrosse beautifully. You look at this team, right? Nakai is obviously a phenomenal football player, a 4-4-40 type guy, outstanding in the weight room. JT Giles Harris, brothers in the NFL. Cade Van Rapport, dad played at Arizona State, uncle played in the NFL. So the athletes on this Duke team are just next level and extremely impressive when you talk to Coach Nowski about what they do in the weight room, what they do in their strength and conditioning tests, and, and some of the numbers they put up. Richmond again looking for the equalizer. Going inside, not a clean pass. Turner up for and handles. And these are those turnovers that you just can't have. And we saw it in the first quarter. We've seen two on these last two possessions. Great ride. Getting the ball right back. Van Rapport's knocked it down. Richmond recovers. Here's Teddy Hatfield. Passing off. Just missed him. It was Ryan Lanchberry on the doorstep. This game would be tied at eight. 
Right, those unforced errors, there's another one. And the Duke alum and Richmond head coach, Dan Shimati, he has to be shaking his head. Here you are, one goal game on the road against the two seed in this tournament. There's been a lot of self-inflicted wounds from Richmond. And they're still in it, right? It's a one goal game and, and they know they haven't positive, played. Yeah. yeah, they haven't played their best lacrosse and they're right there. Relying on their defense to try and come up with another defensive stop. They've stuck with this zone all night long. Oh, got him in the chin. Smith, the extra pass. Joe Robertson makes the Richmond defense pay. First goal of the game for the sophomore leading scorer, and it's 9-7 Blue Devils. Great job by Duke handling the pressure. Reynolds from Richmond, a little too aggressive. Quigley handles it, runs through the check, one to Montgomery, and one more to Joey Robertson right inside. 9-7 Duke. Hurtson gives Duke a 9-7 lead midway through the third quarter. Ryan Flanagan, this game easily could be 8-8, tied midway through the third. Instead, a missed opportunity leads to the goal on the other end. Richmond has been great, better than expected on face-offs, but this is what's killing them. These looks where they have an opportunity, but they just throw it away. That one there, and then you come back on the other end right after that turnover, and there is Joe Robertson right on the crease. So a missed opportunity from Richmond leading to a goal for Duke. And, and that's been a story in a few different scenarios today, which has given Duke the lead. And for Lanchbury, had the first two goals of this game, that would have completed the hat trick. That will go down as a massive missed opportunity. Instead of a tie game, it is a two-goal lead for Duke. You see, yeah, Tyler Schultz has been great for Richmond. We've talked about that initiating out of the midfielder. I think he's a five assist. Talk about it. And then Nakai Montgomery, the two goals he has have been huge, just time and room, get his hands free, bring it high to low. And to add insult to injury, before the goal from Joe Robertson, there was a penalty. Jason Reynolds, the star sophomore, first team all-conference as a defender, as a freshman, and again this year as a sophomore. One minute penalty for a slash. So Duke goes the man up, and this is again, Lacrosse, a game of momentum. The Blue Devils grasping at it in this third quarter. Joe Stein digs it out. Crucial ground ball for the Blue Devils. They can set up their extra man offense. Duke hasn't been great on the man up this year. We talked about that earlier. They're about 30%, just over 30% on the man up. 0 for 2 today. Richmond is shutting Brad Smith, which I like. Montgomery drives one right into the chest of Russ Bold. Richmond recovers into that man down defense. See Montgomery getting more confident as a shooter from the outside. Quick passing again. Russ Bold got a piece of it, keeping Richmond. his Richmond team in it. Oh, I thought Richmond had that. Good hustle from Shada, but Duke's closest. One last shot with the extra man. And Duke scores before the extra man can get on the field, and there's a flag down as well. Richmond had killed the 60 seconds, but before they could get back to even strength. Duke finds the open man. You got this Richmond team rotating. Brad Smith, you see on that righty pipe, but just quick ball movement. You see Richmond rotates, they have to step up here. See there's Caputo step up, and they're gonna call a push. But that gets wiped with the goal, but Brad Smith diving across the front of the cage. Great finish inside. Second goal for the senior tonight.
it gives Duke a three goal lead in this third quarter. And that's a huge swing, right? You, you give up the goal when Reynolds plays a little too aggressive, fouls Quigley, that's the one where Robertson scores, and then on the man up right after that, you give up another goal. So a huge two goal swing. Joe Stein has come into this game for Duke, and he has given such a lift to this faceoff unit. Duke winning more possession, it's led to more goals. Great poke away. Spiders have numbers. Up to Teddy Hatfield. They'll pull it out. Good decision to pull it out. Great ride back from Richmond. Here's Tyler Schultz, five assists today, looking for another one, and that's way over the head of Ryan Lanchberry, not even close to him. I don't know what that was. Is this? I thought that was a shot, but obviously not. Again, just bad decisions with the ball, and Richmond cannot afford to do that. Duke has punished them in this third quarter. What was a tie game is now 10-7 Duke. This is Garrett Ledman, freshman out of DeMatha, passing off, going low. Duke there to back it up. Restarted with Sean Lowry. They've been mixing and matching the midfield all afternoon long. Right now going with Montgomery, Ledman in a combination of Smith and Lowry. They keep changing those two and that's been so hard for Richmond to deal with in this third quarter, get a much needed stop there on the save from Jack Rustbold. Another one of those shots that if you're Richmond, you love to give up. Those 15 yards, same plane. Duke just getting frustrated with the zone defense. And a freshman taking a, a shot that not on camera as Coach Stanowski giving him a, a teaching moment. Duke controlled the three goal lead earlier in this game. It was 7-4 Blue Devils. Richmond threw a punch right back to tie it at seven. Do they have a counter left in the second half? Won't work with turnovers, although Duke gives it right away. That's a rare mistake from the vacuum, Cade Van Rapphorst. This is the missed ground ball. I don't think that should be a reset. No, 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 no possession. Reset to 41. The shot clock was reset. The officials are saying to turn it back down to the time that was left. Yeah, Van Rappers, he never had clear never possession. Had he was just yeah. going for the ground ball. 55 ground balls on the season for Van Rapphorst. Called him a vacuum, but it's what he is, a human vacuum cleaner for this Duke defense. And we started to get into the conversation between him and, and Giles Harris, kind of who's the better Defender, who's going to win more accolades? I don't think Coach Stanowski or Coach Caputo care, but for the argument's sake, I, I'd say probably Van Rapphorst because of those statistics, because of those ground balls. That Great feed. The finish not there. Teddy Hatfield denied, and now Duke can run with it. C.J. Carpenter, two goals to his name today. Riley Walsh lost the ball. Battle for the ground ball. Still on the grass and won by Duke. Great slide. But here's Nakai Montgomery with room. Steps into it, breezes it right by. Cannot give 15 in white space. He's made Richmond pay a couple of times today. Here's Manown curling around. Didn't go to the back of the net. That's save number 10 for Jack Rustbold. Oh 
Under two minutes to play in this third quarter. You get the feeling the Spiders need a goal here at the end of the third quarter, much like they got in the last 10 seconds. You need a good possession. Can't, can't touch it. Went over and back after 20 seconds. Went off the shot clock. And now the delay of game. A simple pass like that, back breaking for unseated Richmond. Yeah, and that's those careless turnovers. A 13 on the day. And that's the stuff that they can't afford. They need to take care of the ball. Need a good possession, need a goal. It's been shut out for over 11 minutes now. It seemed like Duke was going to carry all the momentum in the halftime. Richmond gets a goal. With 10 seconds left of the second quarter, they cut it to a two-goal game, and now Duke goes on the extra man to make it a four-goal game. That'd be the largest lead of the afternoon for either team. And it feels like they haven't had the ball, and they've won face-offs. What a feed! And the finish there from Jill Robertson! But credit Nakai Montgomery. A beautiful find and a four-goal lead for the Blue Devils. We've seen what Nakai Montgomery can do as a shooter. He's getting better every game as a feeder. He's the guy who's going to step up for Duke to make a run. We know about Brad Smith, but here's Montgomery skipping it through the defense. And Robertson again right on the crease. His second right on the doorstop. As he grows as a feeder, it really opens up what this Duke offense can do. We know about Brad Smith and what he can do as a Dodger feeder. As Nakai Montgomery develops that part of his game, and, and he's been getting better every game at it. That'll be huge for Duke if they can advance into the next round of the postseason. Richmond has gone 12 minutes without a goal. You just can't simply afford to do that against this Duke team in May. Any month, really, but certainly not in May. And it's been plays that are going to frustrate Coach Shimadi. We talked earlier about Lance Berry just missing the pass on the doorstep right there on the faceoff, just pushing a guy from behind. A lot of careless turnovers. One of the challenges of playing this zone defense is when you lose it, Duke has the ability to eat off 40, 50 seconds or more every possession. They can hold for the last shot of the third quarter if they choose. Here's Montgomery weaving his way in, stings the corner, Nakai Montgomery! May is his month, Montgomery does it again! And it's a 12-7 lead for Duke. We saw what he could do last May, Memorial Day weekend. And he is picking up where he left off. Inside the defense, he showed us earlier what he could do as a feeder. There he is as a shooter on the run. Showing every part of his game today. The time and room. He's got two that way. He's got two assists. Now he's finishing inside on the run. You said it, two assists. Three goals, a 5 nothing run. This game was tied at 7. Well, Duke has dominated the third quarter. Have time if they wanted to, not with that pass. A 5 nothing run gives Duke a 5-goal lead headed into the fourth and final quarter of regulation. The team of the decade starting to roll here in May. The NCAA Men's Lacrosse Championships is brought to you by GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. And Old Spice. Men have skin too, you know. Tied at seven. 
And then Nikai Montgomery got going. This Duke team on a 5-0 run entering the fourth quarter. The Blue Devils have found another gear, a gear they often find in May in the team of the decade. Looking for what would be their seventh championship weekend this decade and potentially a fourth national championship. Still 15 minutes to go in regulation. He's Ryan Flanagan. I'm Jay Alter. What has been the recipe in this third quarter to lead the charge for Duke? We saw it, number 15, Nakai Montgomery, right? He's showing what he can do. Every shot, it feels like hitting cage. He brings the heat. He's also showing what he can do as a feeder. He's got those two assists. As his game develops, and, and we saw it last year in May, and, and it looks like we're going to see it again this year, but if he can draw the attention of the defense, it's going to open up so much for Robertson, Manown, Brad Smith. He's an elite athlete that can totally change the game when he's on. Much needed possession for Richmond. Duke had won the last four faceoffs. This game has gotten away from the Spiders. But still a lot of time left. Do they have a punch back against a heavyweight team in Duke? Part of the challenge, right, is you, you have this five-goal deficit now, and it, Richmond really has to work to score goals. So they're going to need possessions, and they're going to need to be really efficient because it seems like they have to grind through a possession to get a good look. Here's Hatfield. Reversing course, curling around the cage, looking to get those hands free. Can't do it. 30 seconds left on the shot clock. It bounced in. It'll count. Just what Richmond needed, provided by Mitch Savoca to start this fourth quarter. We've said it over and over. Duke keeps letting these Richmond midfielders get to the middle of the field. Cade Van Rapport's on Mitch Savoca. Usually, guys stay away from Van Rapport's, but when he's above the cage, not his natural position, you can have success. And, and you see it. When these two teams met in the regular season about nine weeks ago at Richmond, Duke had an 8-7 lead at the end of three quarters, shut the Spiders out of the fourth quarter. To get a goal a minute into the fourth quarter, that does give you some confidence. Hey, we're not, we're, look, we already are not getting shut out. Now let's go get four more, give them everything we've got. Shove in the back, Spiders possession. Yeah, and we started to talk about it. They have to really work for their goals. It's not like they're going to push transition. They're not going to score goals 10 seconds into a shot clock. So what you need is, is those early goals. They, they couldn't afford to get into five, six minutes left in the game to start to chew into that five-goal deficit. So you get one at a time. There's one. A second one here on this position a possession would be huge. Here's Savoca, goes right back into attack mode, down the right alley, cuts in, he lost the ball. Fowler scooped it up temporarily, but Richmond gets it right back. It was Savoca, never gave up on the ball, went right after it after he lost it, and Richmond can set up shop again with a fresh 80. That was one of the things that Savoca had trouble with the first time these teams played. It's just the length of some of these Duke long poles, whether it be Scaglione, Wilson Stevenson, Peter Welch, they're all just 6'5", six, 6'6", six, 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 six plus guys that can reach you from just about anywhere on the field. Lance Berry's been quiet. He scored the first two goals of the game, has not scored since. Behind the back pass, Richmond trying to get a good look here, trailing by four. This is Tyler Schultz, career high five assists today. And you can dodge on Giles Harris and Cade Van Rapport above the cage. Takes it all the way himself. Schultz has been the one assisting today. Notches a goal there. And just like that, it's a three goal game again. And it's come against Duke's top defenseman. The first one against Van Rapport, the second one against Giles Harris here. 
When you take close defensemen and you put them above the cage, it is not an easy transition. It's a totally different game when you're dodging above the cage, and you see it there. Dodge on Giles Harris, he goes for the trail check on Schultz, tucks it in front, and the finish. You can take advantage of these defensemen when you bring them above the cage. You're going against the two best defensemen in the country, or one of the best two. How much confidence does that give this attack unit? Look, we got more than 12 minutes left, fellas. Let's go and we got possession again. Let's make this interesting. It's huge. It, beating their top guys, oh. But again, there's those questionable plays. That's one that you probably want to pull that out. Nick DeMauro scored three goals in the SOCON championship game against High Point, the faceoff guy. Trying to be the hero there, instead gives the ball right back to Duke. Relentless ride. A great ride. Leads to Richmond possession. And they have numbers if they want to push it. Great pass. The finish not there. Crease violation. Just could not get it down in time. It was Brett Reed. Never cleanly got it in his cross. It's the second time today, right? They have numbers, they get a little too aggressive, try to force it to the crease, and the turnover. It's that fine line between being aggressive. Aggressive shot from Montgomery. Ross bowled out to meet it. Collects it. It starts the clear attempt. Spiders have dominated the fourth quarter. It was a five-goal deficit. Feels like a mountain to climb against Duke and May. Chipping away at it and still plenty of time to go. And they've shown they can beat their short stick defenders. They've shown they can beat their long poles with these last two goals. Again, it's just take care of the ball, make good decisions with it. You can't have unforced errors if you're Richmond. That should be a flag. Yep. Freebie possession for Richmond. 30 seconds on the timer. Here's the senior, Teddy Hatfield. The extra man opportunity is coming, but still 10 seconds to make it a two-goal game. Good ball movement, but... Maybe one too many passes. Here comes the penalty. Wait, wait, number three with a hole. 30 seconds, wait. She got a little too aggressive. Jack Falk just reaching in there. Got him with a hold for 30 seconds. It's one of those unnecessary checks. Richmond on the man up with a chance to make it a two goal game. They're 0 for 2 on extra man opportunities today. You get the sense they really need to cash in here. Space, but a great save. Turner Upgren read it the whole way to deny Savoka. In your U view, you see the look across from Lanchberry. Savoka with the high to high. And that's too easy for Turner Upgren. And with that save, Duke kills the penalty back to even strength. Spiders 0 for 3 on man up opportunities today. You've seen Montgomery do such a good job of changing planes today. When he shoots, that's what you're looking for out of Savoka on that. Make the goal, he reached down to his feet and his ankles to make the stop. Duke only one shot attempt so far in this fourth quarter. See Montgomery dodge the zone. He's going to try to draw two and move it. Three goals, two assists today. Passing off. It's intercepted. Great stick. 
Jason Reynolds, only a sophomore, he plays like a senior. 23rd cause turnover on the season. Back-to-back all-conference player in the SOCON in his two years so far at Richmond. What does Richmond need to do on this possession to make it a two-goal game? Well, you're going to initiate out of Gallagher. Schultz looks like Gallagher here on the top of your screen, 16. But those are the two that have been able to beat those short stick matchups. Feed inside. Tried to whip it around. Good handle, but I'm, I'm not crazy about the look. Again, I don't like when they force it inside. I know that Lanchbury is very skilled and has a great handle, but... They've had so much success dodging and getting open looks with short sticks that I don't think you need to do that. Twenty seconds on the timer. Savoka muscling his way in, passing off now. Hatfield and Duke hung up at X. And they'll just let him sit. There's ten seconds on the clock. No need to, no need to play him. Five seconds. He goes into the attack. Goes low. Off the pipe inches away from making this a two-goal game, but Hatfield denied. That's one of the changes in the shot clock. When you sit behind the cage, there's no need to play you because you're just wasting your own team's possession. The clock just starts to wind down on the Richmond offense with six and a half to go. You hear John Donowski barking orders. He's 10-2 and two in opening round games since joining Duke. And nine of those 10 first round wins resulted in a trip to championship weekend. A little more than six minutes away from notching another win in the first round. Great double. Ball's loose. You push from behind. Richmond ball, under six minutes to go. Spiders trailing by three. Triple team comes in, somebody's gotta be open. Hatfield is. Duke has struggled in this fourth quarter. Five possessions, four turnovers, only one shot. Good news for the Blue Devils, still a three goal lead. And only five minutes and 30 seconds to work. Good luck. Here's Gallagher. Breezes one by. That all starts with that midfield initiation. I'd like to see them continue to go after that. Here's Savoka with a short stick on him. Finally get it to the sophomore. This is the matchup Richmond wants. Can they capitalize? Stays with the Spiders. 20 seconds left on the shot clock. And a timeout taken by John Donowski. Duke clinging to a three goal advantage. We'll be right back. Five minutes to play. Dan Shamati and the Richmond Spiders have given number two Duke everything they can handle. Trailing by three with possession, coming out of a timeout. Ryan Flanagan, Jay Alter with you. Ryan, what do you expect the Spiders to draw up? You need a goal here to cut it to two. You need a goal. I think time's starting to become an issue if you're Richmond. I think a quicker goal would be better. They've had a lot of success dodging out of the midfield. You're going to see Savoka. Gallagher and Schultz at the top of your field, 15, 16, and 18. Those guys have had success. So I think that's where you want to initiate your offense and start your offense. And then I think you'll see somebody fade out of the backside. It's usually Lanchberry who will fade out, and they try to get a skip pass through to him for the open look. That's where they've had success so far today. Chimati, a Duke alum, won two ACC titles as a player here with Duke. Made his name when he was the offensive coordinator for Loyola, Maryland, when they were national champions in 2012. 
took over this massive project, launched the program at Richmond just six years ago. They've been to the tournament three times in that six years, still in its infancy, and yet giving Duke everything they can handle. Inches away from a two-goal game, Lanchberry could not get it past Upgren. Saved it with his shoulder pad there. Go right back to it. They get Gallagher up high. They start in a 1-4-1 offense. It's called a double mumbo, which you see picks and switches. Lanchberry gets loose inside and right off of Upgren. You're going to go back to it. You're going to see the outside guys on the mumbo come inside. You'll pick your two inside middles will pop out. And it all starts with this dodge up top. Richmond reloads. Looking for that crucial goal. You got the new shot clock on the save, which is huge. It's another 80 seconds that Duke's got to play defense. Only four minutes left in regulation, though. Sand falling out of the hourglass, which is Richmond's season. And with that turnover, Duke will look to kill this clock down. Three goal advantage for the Blue Devils in the driver's seat. Eighteen turnovers for Richmond. If you told that to their head coach, Dan Shimati, before the game, he'd say it's double too many. That's not what he's looking for. He thought they need to play Richmond lacrosse, know who they are, take care of the ball, play good defense, and unfortunately they have not taken care of the ball today. Now the challenge is staying in the zone, letting Duke run another 40 seconds off the clock, and then you'll get the ball back with two and a half to go and down three. Yeah, I think, if, I think you need to go man here and start to press out a little bit, but they seem comfortable just letting Duke eat the clock. And Ball in the cross of Nikai Montgomery. Three goals and two assists today. So dangerous. Passing off this time. Brad Smith had a good look, and Duke reloads. Great save by Jack Rusbold. Flag down after the shot. And that is brutal if you're Richmond. That's a tough call at that stage of the game. Carpenter takes a shot. Dan Chimati, livid for good reason. He knows his season. He's on the line right now. You give Duke an extra man opportunity to just, if they want, kill a minute off the clock. That call more or less ends Richmond's season. Just about end the game. It, Duke will eat a minute here, but you saw Carpenter take the shot. We might get a replay, but Galizia slides up field and hits him on the follow through and kind of a bang bang play, but the refs will call it because of the contact to the head more than likely. And this is just a tough scenario where you're down a man, you, you need the pressure of the ball, but it's not an easy thing to do. And Duke will just continue to move around the outside. Ooh, crucial takeaway. Richmond kills the man up for Duke. And then they to go right away. No time to be patient. Trailing by three, a buck 30 left, and a timeout taken. Richmond gets a full strength opportunity. Still some life left for this Spiders team. And Ryan, win or lose, Richmond's so much to be proud of. Again, this is a program only in year number six. And to be in the NCAA tournament three of those six years, not only be in it, but hang with the number two team in the country. So much to take away from this season. Huge building block for Coach Giamatti. We, we talked to him this week, and when he, so when he looks at the bracket and he looks at his team, he's proud of him. And just look at the tournament field and to have Richmond in that, knowing that he's built this entire program is, I think, something that he can really be proud of. A program that's in a great place and will continue to get better. 
after us. Notre Dame and Johns Hopkins. It starts at South Bend at 7.30. And lacrosse coverage continues next weekend, Saturday, May 18th. Quarterfinal action starts noon Eastern, live on ESPNU. For more information on the 2019 Men's Lacrosse Championship, check out NCAA.com. Hey, that Virginia Maryland one's going to be fun. Oh, my goodness. They have not played, believe it or not, since Maryland left the ACC. It's yep. been a minute. Yep, and, and Virginia, it seems like they've had come back to life as a program since that time. Well, playing what a, their best what a lacrosse. loaded weekend. Yeah. I mean, if you want to go big picture, mm -hmm. you've got round three of the Ivy League championship yep. with Penn and Yale. Yep. You've got the Penn State attack against the best player in the country, in Pat, Pat Spencer. Spencer. Yep. And you've got <laughs> Maryland, Virginia. Yep. And, and it looks like you'll have Duke playing either Notre Dame for the third uh, time or Johns Hopkins. It does Hopkins, not get is, better than that. No, this is the best time of year if you're a lacrosse fan. Richmond says, hey, put it in pencil, not pen in that bracket. But they've got to work quickly. Trailing by three, less than 90 seconds in regulation here. They had two chances where they came inches away. One off Upgren, one off the post. That one just sails over. That would have made it a two-goal game. And the final timeout taken by Dan Chimati. <laughs> Where does this program go from here? Oh, they're going to keep getting better. At Richmond, if you haven't been there, it's a beautiful campus. It's a very good academic institution. I, I think it's a program that's on the rise. The SoCon in general keeps getting better. I think Richmond is a program that is just going to benefit from the growth of lacrosse in the South. Right, So many kids in North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, Georgia, they know what Richmond is. It's, it's a school that they aspire to because of how strong it is academically. So... As lacrosse in the South grows, they'll benefit and they'll continue to pull down more kids from the traditional hotbeds and from the West Coast, be it California and Texas. While we're at a timeout, let's take a look at the other side of the bracket we were just talking about. That quarterfinal is set. We know who is going to play who. At the top, Penn State Loyola. Let's break down that matchup. What? If you like offense. First to 20? Exactly. It's going to be high scoring. What, that is essentially the Tewarton matchup, right? It, it's Grant Amon for Penn State. It's Pat Spencer for Loyola. The two best players in college lacrosse. I don't think anybody could argue that. I think the challenge there is going to be Loyola's defense against Penn State's offense. I, I don't think Loyola played their best day defensively against Syracuse yesterday. Did enough to win the game, but the Penn State offense is a whole nother animal. Move the ball better than anybody. Shoot the ball. Collectively as a team, better than any team in the country. And then on the bottom side of that bracket, Yale and Penn. Third matchup of the season. Yale, the defending national champions, and Penn has beaten them twice so far already this year. They've got some ballers on their own. Richmond out of timeouts. One minute left. You need three goals. They got one. Tate Gallagher with a bullet to the back of the net. That's his fourth of the afternoon. You win a couple of face-offs and there's a chance. You push it, yep, you win the face-off, you push it. I've said it all day, I love Tate Gallagher's game. I think he's got a huge upside. Great look through the defense by Hatfield and Stinger. Right over that inside shoulder, off stick side on Upgren. Good luck saving that. It's a career high for goals in a game for Tate Gallagher. Sophomore eligibility, the future is bright for Gallagher and this Richmond Spiders program. Great work ethic, talking to Coach Tamati, he and Men just two of the hardest working guys on the team, roommates. Crucial face-off win for Joe Stein, but he lost the handle. Richmond has life. There's a challenge. Richmond doesn't have any timeouts left, so they've got to get the ball and go right away. Sean Mengus picked up the ground ball. Here you go. Right back to Gallagher. Why not? Has to hurry. 30 seconds remaining in regulation. Feet inside. We've got a one goal game. Ryan Lee. We might have spoken too soon. Caught it and scored. The connection from fellow senior Teddy Hatfield. And it all started off the Joe Stein just missing the ground ball. Then there it is, the fake. 
Look him come around the crease inside. The great finish by Ryan Lee. Richmond is not ready to end it yet. 25 seconds to go. No timeouts for Richmond. Huge faceoff coming up. Richmond was left for dead. Down three goals and a minute to go. 25 seconds to tie this game up after two goals in 30 seconds. Stein has the faceoff win. Duke just needs the kill clock. Richmond throwing bodies at the ball. They're going to send it. 10 seconds. Van Raphorst, the senior leader, trying to close out this game. Nobody can touch him. Duke hangs on. A 12-11 thriller. The two-seeded Blue Devils avoid disaster. Richmond gave them everything they can handle. John Donowski survives and advances to the quarterfinal. You could not say enough positive things about the way this Richmond team came out and competed. We said it coming into the game, they were not intimidated by the Blue Blood programs. Talked about the win over Notre Dame this year, and, and you saw it. They fought the entire game down to the last play. Coach Giamatti spoke very highly about his team all week, about how hard they play and the effort they give and practice every day in every game. You couldn't ask for much more out of the effort they gave. Could have been better with the ball in their stick, but to fight back from a three-goal deficit with under two minutes to go, incredibly impressed by the Richmond team. Duke was not pretty, but the number two seed books a spot in the quarterfinal. If you had to point to one player, Capital One player of the game, Nakai Montgomery, three goals, two assists. He's Mr. May. Right, and this is his time of year. We saw it last year in the Final Four. Here he is, give him room. He can shoot with time and room. Even the slightest bit of space, he keeps getting better as a shooter. Here he is inside. Finishing in traffic. Showed to be